Welcome. We're going to start with a few spoilers. This is what the end of the amplifier looks like on each side. We'll also talk about the software. This amplifier looks pretty clean at less than half a volt. But more than half a volt in? Not so good. Input voltage on the left, output voltage on the right. Clipping occurs regardless of output and even with EQ. So what we're going to talk about is the Zapco ST-6X DSP. This amplifier is new to the market and it's a little bit late as far as product arrivals go. One of the primary challenges with this amplifier is that we want to know how do we interface with it. Mostly when you're working with an amplifier, you're going to be using the dials and knobs on the sides of it. But a DSP enabled amplifier isn't going to have any of that. It's simply going to have a button and maybe a places to plug in a USB cable. This is the software that the manufacturer provides to you. Now, what our first question is when we want to set up an amplifier is we have to match the input sensitivity of the amplifier with the output voltage of our head unit. So we're, this is the screen that you get. It shows you all six amplified channels, the six channel amplifier and the two pre out. So it's got eight channels of DSP. You have the frequency, the type of filter, Leibniz Riley, Butterworth, etc. The slope, you have for high pass and for low pass, frequency, type, and slope. You have phase, you have level, then you have individual muting. Now, we would like sometimes to be able to change the name of our inputs, but we can't do that. Zapco did not build in functionality in the software to change any of the outputs. You get front, left, and right tweeter, front, left, and right woofer, rear, left, rear, white, right, and outs. So you can't actually change the name of that. You're going to have to keep track of that for a three-way front stage like most of us want to use this for. You're not going to be able to change those. Uh, you're just going to have to understand what you're doing and adapt it from there. Same thing with the screen, the speaker delay setup. It doesn't actually let us change the naming or orientation. It's fixed. You can do milliseconds, centimeters, or inches. Remember, that's not the distance the speaker is from you, but the amount of delay that you're looking to provide. If you're going to calculate delay with this DSP, you actually have to calculate the distance to all your speakers, and then you're entering in the difference between the longest distance and all the shorter distances. But we want to set up input gain first, like input sensitivity. So we can't do it on the screen. Uh, we do have output of each channel, and we have a master output, but those aren't input gain. So we're looking for input gain here. So we go to channel setup. This is where you're going to choose between Toslink or digital or analog into the RCA jacks. You can also choose each of these channels. If I select channel one, I can do channel summing. So I can say channels one, three, and five are going to sum. I could do channel three. I can do channel five. One through eight all give me the ability to do custom summing. I can do a preset two channel input. I can do a four channel input, six channel input as shortcuts to what I want to do for channel seven and eight. I can do sums. So it sums all the inputs into all the channels equally, or I can come back to custom where I actually have to choose channel one is channel one, channel two is channel two. And you might build this. So channel three, maybe you got a two channel input. That's what I'm inputting here. We're just going to assume channel one is left and channel two is right. But you can notice I don't actually have input gain. That's because this amplifier doesn't have that. They managed to forget the first step in setting up any amplifier. They managed to leave that out of this software. It does not exist. You have two screens. You have this input channel screen that has no opportunity to set your input signal strength for each one of these channels. And you have output gain. You have output level and master level. But you don't have input sensitivity. We don't actually know what the input sensitivity of this amplifier is because the manufacturer said it's 0.25 volts to 5 volts. It's variable. Why? Because that's what the variable input sensitivity is for the non-DSP version. But this isn't the non-DSP version. The manual says adjust the potentiometers to adjust your input sensitivity. This does not have potentiometers because this does not have an analog front end. It's got a digital front end. So what does that mean? Well, that means that you don't get to adjust input sensitivity with this amplifier. They've just decided to leave that out. 
Now, I find it hard to believe, and I spent two hours trying to find it. It doesn't exist. Let's forget the fact that you can't actually use this amplifier because it doesn't have input sensitivity, and let's focus on the rest of it. That's pretty good. You get to see all the individual channels simultaneously. They are also color-coded. It's random. It doesn't make any sense. You can't actually change that either. But you do have a 10-band parametric EQ. So you can make an EQ adjustment in gain, and you can select the Q, and you can select gain amounts. So that's kind of handy. So you do actually have a parametric equalizer that you can dial in, you know, the exact two decimal points. So within about 10 hertz or so, you can dial in your frequency and you can adjust your slope. So that's pretty handy. The EQ function is per channel. I like that. Uh, you do also obviously have an overall signal level, but without input gain, we got to ask ourselves, like how truly useful is this amplifier? Now I'm going to show you separate photos and actually review the inputs and outputs in the amplifier next but we're going to start with this because this is really the biggest part that makes this amplifier a not ready for production and b not usable to anybody that doesn't have a head unit that magically matches whatever they've decided to place the input sensitivity at which they haven't published yet we don't actually know so i'm going to set up the scope and i'm going to try and test it now we want to take a look at the actual manufacturer's configuration of these amplifiers. So this is the Zabco ST6X DSP, as we've talked about previously, and this is the ST2000MX2. Now combined, you're looking at like $1,100 for a six-channel DSP-enabled amplifier with an output you can feed to a 2,000 watt at one ohm subwoofer amplifier. Now we've been looking for this in our industry for a long time. Affordability, DSP built in, good power for the substage, flexibility for a three-way front stage. It almost seems too good to be true. And at the price point, it's actually really super competitive. You compare that to say this is the JL Audio VX 1000 slash 5i, and yeah, the JL Audio is much smaller, and in general has less power. So it's got less power, but it is one tight, neat package. This is a five-channel amplifier. It does not have 2,000 watts for the sub, and it doesn't have the power rating that this does either. However, that one works. It's DSP, does exactly what you want it to, and it has input gain. Imagine that. So let's take a look at these ends here. We're going to see that obviously we have power, ground, remote. We have our six channel outputs. Pretty standard amplifier design. There is no fusing here. On the other side, we have four RCAs. Then we have fiber optic input. We have high level input. We have an auto turn on button. We have a USB, and then we have a comms port. That's for possible future upgrades, and also there's some Bluetooth capability you can do. You have power, protection, and USB buttons. When you're plugged into USB and it recognizes it, this light turns blue. Overall, the amplifier is quite pretty. It's got a neat, sleek, neat, sleek design, and these two amplifiers side by side look really good. One of the downsides to the VXI series is that while this amplifier looks awesome, they do not have a non-DSP enabled subwoofer amplifier, meaning if you don't want to spend all the money for a subwoofer enabled amplifier, you actually have to buy something that doesn't look like this. Most of us are going to care about that. The HD series looks similar, but not similar enough. So you're stuck with buying a limited power option, 1000 watt DSP enabled subwoofer amplifier. That's technically not necessary, but it does sound really good and it's built really well. The VXI has similar inputs, but we're not here to talk about that. Now on the 2000, you have one on inputs for power ground. You have your traditional four outputs for dual coil subs or multiple subs, sub in and or RCA in and out. And then you're going to have your gain, your low pass, your subsonic, your bass boost frequency, your bass boost level, and an adjustable phase, as well as a remote control that is remotely located. And it does come with a remote control. You do get a standard little bass knob that you can run with a phone cable. Now, while the amplifier looks really good, again, remind yourself that you don't actually have input adjustabilities. There are no dials here for input gain. And as we showed with the software, the software doesn't give you that either. So we're coming back to the primary complaint with this amplifier is that they missed entirely input gain. All right, what we're trying to figure out here is does the output level adjustments that are available within this Zapco amplifier going to affect gain. Right now what we have is an Alpine head unit. And if I take the output of the head unit to 4.46 volts, less than half a volt, you can see that I'm not clipping. 
and I have an 18.6 volt VAC output. If I go to volume 22, I go above 0.5. On 0.58, I am clipping, and I have a 23 VAC output. Now, the question that we're going to run into, let's clip it a little bit more so it's obvious, right? That's pretty obvious. Does these levels affect gain? Obviously, the channel does not. Does the maximum master level? No, it doesn't. Even at a low level, it's still clipping. These are output levels only. They are not input gain levels or input sensitivity adjustments. Therefore, they are not gain. This amplifier lacks that entirely. If you can keep the input signal strength under half a volt, that's 0 0.5 volts AC, then we don't observe any clipping. Now, I didn't try and get exactly to 0 0.5 on this amplifier because I didn't spend any time adjusting the fader maybe to try and dial in an output voltage. I went from a volume click that gave me what you see here to the next volume click that went over 0 0.5 volts and it introduced clipping as you'll see next. At the next volume click we go above 0 0.5 volts on the input and we immediately see clipping on the output. Now I observed earlier that if I adjust the output levels either in the channel or in the master that that clipping still remains so this is an input signal clip that we can't do anything about I can't attenuate this within the amplifier you can only determine which head unit volume level stays under half a volt and don't go above that The next volume click took us to 0 0.74 volts in the input, and you can see the clipping is becoming quite substantial. It is not hard for most head units on the market to reach this volume output around half or 60% of max volume. There's a lot going on in this picture. In the background, you see the input voltage DMM at less than half a volt yet we see clipping at the scope. Now that's because I introduced a little bit of EQ boost at the same frequency as the test tone, 150 hertz. This tells us that within the way the DSP processes audio, we have the ability to use EQ to cause clipping even sooner. And this is not overdriving the output, mind you, simply within the input signal architecture. This is a cleaner picture of the input channel setup part of the software where you can see some input routing options, but you can also notice that there are no opportunities here to adjust the input signal strength. The JL Audio product, for example, has individual input sensitivity levels and a light to indicate when you are clipping or starting to clip that input signal. Very useful when setting your gains. This is another view of the input screen where you can see the custom or sum doesn't allow for input gain either, uh, even though that you might expect that. And here is a larger view of the main tuning screen. You can see time alignment up on the left. You can see your individual channel labels that I said before you can't change yet. They could do that in a firmware update. You also have your crossover settings, your level outputs, as well as your master level. And you can see an example of what the EQ screen looks like, where you can dial in frequencies to within 100 hertz. You can also adjust your Q and obviously adjust your gain. So this is a nice final picture of the software screen that you get. You can also see you do get some channel grouping buttons within that uh, option as well. And then you can change the parameters of your time alignment. Hopefully this has been helpful. I didn't just bench test this amplifier. I actually installed it in a car to start. And unfortunately, after installing it in the vehicle and spending hours trying to tune it and set it up, came to the sad realization that I could not adjust input gain and the 5 volt output on the Kenwood Exelon head unit was simply too much to drive these amplifiers. After a week of trying to figure this out and communicating with um, my Zacco reps, 
I decided that this amplifier was not ready for production, therefore it was not ready for the vehicle, and it has been since removed and is going to be sent back. That's too bad because I liked the way this looked inside the vehicle. Instead, we're going to go back to the Audison LRX 5.1K and then eventually install a JL Audio VXI. Quite honestly, having the Audison and just the tuning available in the head unit sounded a lot better than anything we got out of this combo here shown, but it did look good while it lasted. We tried a quick experiment using the Harrison Labs F mods to attenuate the input signal so that, we, that way we could still use the head unit volume range, but this was only going to knock it down to about 1.8 volts, and as we found out later in testing, that wasn't nearly enough attenuation. So this is not a very long-term solution because you'll put a lot of stress on the connectors, and at the end of the day, it shouldn't be necessary.